G'day fellas. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Portuguese Water Boom FF. It's a strategy that's incredibly strong because you build up such a huge amount of villages in such a short amount of time and you overpower your opponent with just pure economic force. Before we do get into the video though, if this video has been uploaded in the last five hours, then you can find me live on Twitch. I'll leave a link down in the description. I'm going to be playing some one versus one and I'm going to be using Portugal as well as Sweden and probably some other civilizations. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, head on over to Twitch, say good day in the chat and I'll see you over there. Now let's get to the strategy. Aussie drum! Aussie drum! Aussie drum! Yeah! You're going to want to start by collecting your food crates with your villagers. You're going to make sure that you pick all three of the food crates up and then immediately move your villagers over to food. You're not bothering with any of the wood crates yet. And the reason why? You're not building a house. So what we're going to be doing here is commonly known as the 10 out of 10. Or you'll often see it expressed as 10-10. This is different to say a 13 over 20 or a 12 over 20, which is a more common build with the Portuguese. With this expression, the first number is going to be your villager population. The second number is going to be your total population, including your town center and your houses. So the reason why we're doing the 10-10 is because it enables us to age up a lot faster and send our 700 wood. And you might be wondering, okay, but what's so special about 700 wood? Well, the 700 wood shipment is going to enable us to get up our third dock and continue production of our fishing boats. It's also going to enable us to put down more houses and continue our boom. And so the reason why we're aging up so early is because we get our second town center faster and we also get that 700 wood faster. If we were to age up with 13 villages or 12 villages, we'd be looking at a much slower age up, which would mean as a result of doing that, that our boom would be delayed. By doing this, it means that we're able to be much faster and begin to see our economic returns coming back to us a lot sooner than what they otherwise would. So in this game, despite starting with a market and an in-base coin treasure, I avoided researching hunting dogs as to maintain the integrity of the build order and demonstrate that it's possible to do without having a free market. So this is the card order that you're going to be following. Schooners, 700 wood, rendering plant, whale oil. The next card that you send will be dependent on your game and the matchup that you're playing and how aggressive your opponent is playing. As an example, if you're against a Dutch player who hasn't put any pressure out onto the map, then you can feel free to send a thousand wood as your first card in the third age. Otherwise, you might opt for something like five dragoons, eight casadors, or a frigate. The treasures that you're going to be prioritizing in the early game are food treasures and wood treasures. Ideally, you want to be looking for food treasures before you age up. After you've clicked up though, you don't need to find any food treasures anymore, and you can focus completely on collecting wood treasures. People often treat the golden rule of Age of Empires as never have an idle TC. But due to the way that shipments work and 700 wood being so powerful for the Portuguese and many other booming civilizations, it means that that rule often goes out the window. In this game, you could see that I had an idle town center for quite some time. This is a normal part of the strategy and you will be repaid by having your second town center up earlier as well as your docks up sooner. During the transition period, you're gonna be moving all of your villagers over to wood and you're also gonna be sending out a forward villager which is going to be building your dock. When you position your dock, it's important that you position it towards the center of the map. Ideally, you don't wanna be hiding it away. It's okay to let your opponent know that you're gonna be water booming and almost challenge them to try and stop you. The Portuguese are the strongest civilization when it comes to contesting water in the early game, and you'll have more than enough tools to deal with an opponent who attempts to challenge you on water. By putting your town center and your docks in the middle of the map along the shoreline, it enables you to control more of the water and as a result have more fish that are safe for you to gather from. When you place your first dock, ideally you want to place it almost immediately next to a fish, so that if your opponent does pressure you, you're able to immediately garrison, and when the opponent's pressure has ceased, you can begin gathering immediately without any walk time or risk to your fishing boats. When you go the 10-10 build, it's also important to remember you need to build a house in transition, otherwise you're going to get your dock up and not have enough population space to begin producing fishing boats. It's also reasonable to leave one or two villages on food so that you can gather enough food so that when you've aged up, you're not gonna have an idle town center immediately. It's gonna take some time for your fishing boats to begin gathering enough food so that you're able to support both of your town centers. So at least initially, it is reasonable to have one or two settlers on food just to support you through the transition period. So for anybody who did miss it, we aged up with the Quartermaster, which provides us with 400 wood upon age up. In the transition period, we built a single dock, and when we collected that 400 wood, we also built a second dock. When our 700 wood arrives, we're going to be putting down our third dock. This will be our final dock, and all that we need to produce fishing boats. It's important to remember in the Definitive Edition that Schooners actually increases the rate at which your fishing boats spawn. 
reducing the build time from 25 seconds down to 15 seconds, which means that without schooners, you're not going to be producing as many boats as you would with schooners in the same amount of time. You're going to continue production from your town center with villages. It's really important that you maintain production of villages despite having three docks producing fishing boats over time for you. Because while the whales in the water will last forever, the fish will not. And it's important that you maintain the integrity of your land economy and not rely on your water economy for the remainder of the game. So in the meantime, we're gonna keep producing villages from both town centers as much as possible. One of the most important parts of this strategy is the use of walls. Walls can delay your opponent from sieging a certain building, or they can just prevent your opponent from passing through an area. Often, if your opponent sees walls, instead of sieging them, they're just going to try walking around them. And using this, we can prevent them from accessing certain areas or funnel them into a space that we would like them to go. So typically, you're going to want a wall around your town center. You're going to want to provide enough space that your town center is still able to shoot enemies that are sieging the walls. But at the same time, you don't want your town center to be crowded with walls around it. So it's important that you give it a little bit of space. If you don't know how to do pillarless walls, I've linked down in the description to a video from Samurai Revolution where he explains how to do pillarless walls. So I encourage you to head over to his channel, watch that video, make sure that you know how to use pillarless walls because they are imperative to use if you want to climb the ladder. It reduces the amount of time your villagers take to build walls and reduces the cost of the walls significantly. Anybody who's playing Age of Empires 3 Definitive Edition at a high level is going to be using pillarless walls, and in some cases, wallless pillars. Oh no! <gasps> no! <laughs> oh my god! It finally happened! <laughs> All we have left are pillars now, boys. Oh my. So when it comes to defending against enemy pressure, there's a number of different ways that you can do that. For me personally, I'm a bit more of a passive player. I just like to let the enemy come in, try and do his best to idle me, and then just go back to work. There are others who will instead use a stable. So if you are going to be building military buildings, I encourage you to build them along the shoreline. And the reason why you're going to be building them along the shoreline is because your ships, inevitably when you build them, are going to be able to defend them against any enemy attackers on land. Different civilizations are going to be applying different levels of pressure to you, as I mentioned earlier in the video. So whether you send a thousand wood upon Age Up, or eight Casador, or five Dragoon, or a frigate, is dependent on the situation that you're in. Now, even though the enemy's pressuring me here with musketeers and with hussars, I'm still not fussed, and I think I'm in a position considering the circumstances where I can go and send a thousand wood, which is essentially the most greedy option that you can take at this moment. This 1000 wood is going to enable me to drop down a second stable, it's going to enable me to drop down a second barracks, and it's going to mean that I don't have to really worry about wood for the remainder of the early fortress period. I'm also going to be able to use it to continue building houses. So ideally, if I get this thousand wood, it's going to mean I can just focus on food and coin and get my military units under production. Maintaining control over the water is one of the most important things that you can do as Portugal. So if your opponent begins to challenge you, there's not really such a thing as over-investing. In this situation, my opponent has aged up and he's gone with the caravel. So I immediately recognize that because of this, he now knows about my water presence. And that means that I have to react. So whether that means he's gonna be shipping a frigate now that he's up in the third age, or whether he's gonna be looking to put down a dock, I need to react and I need to react swiftly. So the first thing I do is begin shipping a frigate as well as making a frigate of my own. This means that I'm going to be able to beat back his caravel and a frigate if he ships it and secure my economy on the water so that it's not threatened by the enemy. The unit composition that you're going to be aiming for is Dragoon and Casadors. Casadors are one of the best units in the game at skirmishing and Dragoons from the Portuguese are incredibly powerful because of their upgrade card in the third age. Because you're going to be generating a lot of coin from your water resources, it's important that you also include artillery in this mix, which means both organ guns as well as culverin in the third age, and when you age up to the fourth age, making horse artillery. When you're pushing on your opponent, it's important that you keep your dragoons and castors very close to each other. These units support each other incredibly well, so it's important that they're right next to each other so that the enemy is hesitant to push in and attack you. Because my opponent has invested so heavily in infrastructure along the coastline, it means that there's not really much of an army. And so it means that the final battle here, unfortunately, isn't quite as amazing as I'd hoped for. 
This strategy in build order is incredibly solid and it guarantees Portugal a real fighting chance on any map that's got water with at least four whales in it. If you've enjoyed this video, I encourage you to leave a like on the video below as it really helps out the channel. Other than that, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.